Welcome to this episode of Season 4 of The Common Bridge, where policy and current events are discussed in a fiercely nonpartisan manner. The host, Richard Helpe, is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and political analyst who has reached over 3.5 million listeners, viewers, and readers around the world. The Common Bridge is available on the Substack website and the Substack app. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can find the program on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. The Common Bridge draws guests and audiences from across the political spectrum, and we invite you to become a free or paid subscriber on your favorite medium. Hello, welcome to The Common Bridge. I'm your host, Rich Helpy, and we have a great guest with us today, a a famous actor, Greg Jabara. Uh, Greg, it is very good to see you. Hello, Rich. You can see me now, actually. Indeed, yes, oh, we good. can see you. Good. Uh, we'll talk about Greg's uh, background on stage, on film, and of course on television programs. Uh, today, we've got a very important topic. It might not seem important, uh, but it is. It's about the strike of the actors and the writers in Hollywood uh, for a big umbrella uh, title. So uh, we're going to just jump right into it uh, with our guest, Greg Jabara, award-winning actor. Um, Greg, uh, I know that you're well known to very many people. Um, and I think at an early age, you wanted to get into the arts. Um, you were talented uh, enough to get into Juilliard. And then your career took off from there. Can you kind of give a little bit of the career arc? And don't leave out anything important like winning a Tony Award and being nominated elsewhere. I think it's important for people to know. Okay. Well, the the real starting point is being a child who grew up through the Wayne Westland public school system, because from K through 12, uh, as you well know, there were opportunities available to us that um, that don't exist uh, a, a, as readily, at, le- at least not in the Wayne Westland community, as prevalently as it was. But when we were going to school, you know, the the boomers were throwing tax money at education, and we had a TV studio in our high school. We had a 68-member male chorus in our high school that I was a member of. Uh, there was, you know, very active student politics, uh, you know, foot sports, everything you could possibly want. And I had, over the years, found that I had a knack in the performing arts and gratefully had the opportunity to develop those talents. And when physics, though a passion, didn't become my journey in life because the academic world is a little more competitive. I was very competitive as a performing arts person and went to the University of Michigan. Parents said, no, you're not going to be an actor. You're going to be a communications major. I went, okay. And then all I did was non-departmental theater while I was at Michigan with a minor in physics and a major in communications. And while I was there and being cast in every non-department show that was happening, and then my, to my parents' dismay, changing my major to theater and doing nothing but, and being a, a founding class member of the musical theater program that is now in existence. Uh, also, the Impact Jazz Dance Company that still is thriving as a non-department dance company uh, with the uh, students at uh, Michigan, still happening today. Those are all things I did, but my, the faculty, my mentors, they went you know, the musical theater program's new. We don't know whether it's going to take off. You have a, a, a an ability to compete on a higher level. I was encouraged to look at other programs. I call it the Michigan Mafia because then Sharon Jensen, a Michigan alumnus, was the president of the League of Professional Theater Training Schools. And she, I got on the phone with her because she was best friends with my voice teacher and mentor, uh, Connie Barron. And she told me all about the league schools. And I made the decision that if I was going to leave Michigan, and that meant even if Michigan didn't stay, if the musical theater program didn't work, I could go to Wayne State or or Eastern or other options and stay in state. But I knew if I really wanted to do this, I needed to go to New York. And the idea being, as a student, when I finally did get accepted into Juilliard, that all of your work that you do in your last two years is open to the public. So the industry gets to see your breadth of ability over two years where people who get really great training, say in the middle of America, and then have to go and beat the pavement in New York or Los Angeles, they're kind of starting at ground zero once they're done with graduation. If if they're, if they're not in a program that has say a presentation at the end that, you know, serves up their graduating class, which is 
pretty prevalent now in the training programs. But I, I went to New York knowing that that's where I had to be because I'm also, you know, I, I like to sing. I can move without embarrassing myself. And uh, and then when I gra- survived the four years at Juilliard, because then they did a cut after the second year uh, of the original 26 students, they cut the class down and not just to cut the class. They, they let students go who really don't need the training, who are ready to fly and be, you know, pushed out of the nest. And so they're not just taking their money. And then there are students that probably need to rethink what they really want to do in life. And those people are, are let go. Uh, but also when you're in repertory, meaning you're doing three or four shows a year and you have 26 actors, it'd be very difficult to give all 26 actors meaty work in all the production. So by having a smaller class toward the end of your year, you were able to better uh, challenge every single actor. And fortunately, I survived that entire process. So and did, were, did you start at uh, on the stage, on the screen, or through television? Where, where did you get, where'd you get going? So my first job was actually for the Detroit Free Press. No kidding. It was a TV commercial. My very first union job was on-camera commercial for the Detroit Free Press, and it was cast in New York and shot in New York. And I was still a student. Well, I still a. Actually, I I graduated. I just graduated, but that was my first on-camera job. My first voiceover job while I was still a student was fourteen national commercials for Norelco. Uh, back then there was the Molson golden couple. There was like, you know, witty banter, sexy, you know, dialogue between a couple talking about Molson golden beer. So Norelco wanted to do the same thing, showcasing their products, but having these, this attractive couple being that witty. Well, they hired the models. They didn't like the way they sounded. They hired Lauren Brown and myself to be the voices. So we overdubbed everything on those commercials. And that was my foray into working as an actor. And the one class that I wish I had while I was at Juilliard was finance because there's common sense. Uh, I mean, you know that you have to pay their taxes. There's, you know, withholding for FICA, but I just assumed it was all being done. You, you are a a paycheck goes to the payroll department at your talent agency. They take their 10%. You get your check and I look and I go, okay, they're taking X amount out. But for my entire life, since I was a janitor at Wayne Dale Plaza on Wayne, Michigan, at next to Marshall Junior High, I always wrote exempt on my tax returns because I never made more than $5,000. Habitually, when I booked that job, not knowing, I wrote exempt and uh, ended up with a significant uh, debt. It, my student loan, about ten thousand dollars that my very creative and brand new accountant, who nearly had a heart attack, uh, managed to work out, and uh, it was a. Uh, he he still quotes me to this day. He goes, "You the first thing out of your mouth was when I said, oh, here's all the money you're going to owe. Do you have anything?'" And I I had like three hundred dollars in my pocket, and he said, and I said, "Well, good thing I'm young, because you know <laughs> ultimately it took about eight years." but got out from underneath that debt while I was a working actor doing commercials. The, so the so government- your, your, your fame, not only from being a Tony Award winner on Broadway and Billy Elliot, which I had the privilege to see, you were great in that, and being on television programs, which I'm not sure I can talk about during the strike period, and, and being in uh, movies. Um, you're also well known at the uh, Internal Revenue Service. Okay, I mean you've really, <laughs> literally covered the waterfront here. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, for for hope may 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 no one listening ever have to suffer this, but the government finds your source of income and then they start leaning on it. The great thing about being an actor, where you were constantly looking for new work, is by the time they found a commercial I did and start leaning on that income, I'd already booked another one so they could start taking that money. And it was, you know, a slow, brutal process, but ultimately uh, it it's behind me. And it's the first thing I ever teach in a master class is get to know your fiscal responsibilities. Well, that is uh, very germane to what we want to talk about today because uh, the entertainment industry is an industry. It is a business. Uh, and in a business, we have owners, we have uh, marketeers, we have financiers, um, and we have labor. Um, 
and you've been at this game for a long time. And now, you know, we're hearing about there's a strike in Hollywood. This is the way it's being presented. And most people either don't know, don't care, or both. Um, but I, I think this has implications beyond the entertainment industry is my take on it. Um, and your challenge today is to take me from a level of a reasonably intelligent kindergartner to, you know, something into the PhD range. So you can assume like absolute ignorance and infinite intellect um, because what, you do and what you've done in your career, um, it's very opaque to people that are not there. Um, that don't, I don't even understand the names of all the players and um, how things work. Um, but I'm above average at finance if you ever need some help with that. So <laughs> great. And the IRS has no idea who I am, I hope. So there's that. <laughs> okay. So so, Greg, who are the players in this drama right now? We've heard about SAG and WGA and studio heads. And, and who's who are the combatants here? So since probably the 60s, which was the last very important creative strike against the producers, AMPTP is the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. So it's all the people that create entertainment content they have this organization that represents them when it comes to negotiating contracts with all the different unions. Then you've got, they're, they're the, it's them against currently, uh, the WGA is the Writers Guild, uh, and they are all the people who create the stories, who put pen to paper, who do the rewrites. They are, they are Shakespeare. They are, the play is the thing without content without great stories without great writers writing great stories you don't have entertainment and then the other party that is uh, currently in uh, striking against amptp is uh, sag aftra and it's screen actors guild uh, uh wait uh federal american federal wait t t t uh what is AFTRA? Well, the sag the is american originally of american television Federation. and radio artists right okay so the S Screen Actors Guild, they used to be two separate entities. Screen Actors Guild used to represent just people who worked on film. Like if, if your work was recorded on celluloid, on film, because back in the day, there was just film. And the people that did radio were, uh, were, were after a union members. Then video came along with television. And television, because it's not on film, it's a... Uh, electronic signal analog but they became a part of aftra and then as years went on and uh, new media c came out and they're streaming and there's you know er everybody's got a ca movie camera on their phone uh the unions found they had better power if they worked together in negotiations and like in 1960 with the emergence of television and all the producers who when they made a movie you make a movie, you pay an actor, and the fee that they get includes uh, all their days of working and then f the right for that producer to air that film theatrically in theaters. And that used to be all there was. Then television came along, and the producers are on these f who own these films then can resell that content to television networks and run it ad nauseum. And it took several years, but finally the union said, hey, wait, this is, you're making more money off of, because you're reselling content that didn't exist when we initially had our contracts. It's time that we rethink how this all works. And through a strike and uh, some very impressive celebrity leadership at the time, uh, they, including Ronald Reagan and Tony Curtis, um, they came to an agreement and there was a residual structure that now was in place. And that held up through network television. Now we've got this thing that the label is, um, what is it called? It's called, uh, it, there's a term for other than television. It's called electronic media, uh, 
what is it? There's another term. I should know this, and I do, but I'm 62 almost, and I'm allowed to forget everything. Um, <laughs> well, is this kind of getting into the, the, the pivot from theatrical release and television, uh, network television, to streaming, yeah, where there's so content being produced and placed out there? Right. And, and for the last, since streaming has been out there, um, it's, it's called something something content. Anyway, they, they've, they're, they said, look, we're only going to pay a, 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 a minimal amount right now to figure out what, what actually this beast is. And, and the laborers, the directors, the writers, the, all the stagehands, all the actors, everyone. Yeah, that's fair. Till we figure out what it is. It's more than 10 years and all the streaming manufacturers, Netflix, uh, Disney plus they're making a lot of money in subscriber sales. And now they have tangible ways of tracking what's being seen, who's seeing it, uh, that, that sort of thing. And yet they're not disclosing what the, that information is. They don't want to say, Oh, here's how we know, because what now what the directors and the actors want is now that you're, we know what the beast is and you're going to make X billion dollars a year. We're asking for a very, 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 very small percentage of profits, the same, even less actually than the ratio that's happening currently with the existing residual structure for television and for film. So it's, but they, we just want a piece of the action now. And the, the, the streaming creators owners they, they don't want to they don't want to share that's that's yeah. basically it. That, in terms of dollars was, yeah I, look i thought that was curious because i i was doing some reading uh in preparation for this and uh take a writer for example that a show would get picked up for a season they would write 22 episodes they knew they had an income stream uh they knew that if the show went into syndication that they got a, a residual um and now they you know, they, they get contracted to do something that's streaming. They, number one, don't know how long they're going to work because they don't know how many episodes are going to be. Right. Uh, number two, um, there isn't a clear path to residuals because ha ha fooled you that now, since we're not sending it out on network TV, uh, you don't get any part of that streaming revenue where, you know, wait a minute, you know, there's something I might want to binge that was made 10 years ago. And, right. the, and, the crew, the actors, uh, never got a chance to, to benefit from my subscription. If I'm understanding right. that right. That that's a very accurate assessment that the, and, and what's frustrating is if you're a, if you subscribe to variety magazine or entertainment weeklies or monthlies, there there's actually ratings for the top viewed streaming entertainment content. And, and they, they can calculate in minutes, minutes of viewing time. So like suits and there's a couple, even um, what's in the top 10 I, I just recently saw, but there, there, there are, there is, there are calculations where they go, where the, the people who own the content know that, that are, there are, there's 8.7 million minutes of eyes on this show, any given block of time. And so the, the ability to track usage and what one of the other sticking points is there the um the unions are going we understand that you're you're a subscriber base it's not like network television where a hot show they can sell their commercial time for x amount of dollars and really hot shows are getting more money per 30 seconds on a tv show than you know than others in streaming with subscriber base everybody pays 15 bucks and they have the right to watch whatever they want but the content providers are able to track that activity and they don't want to divulge that because the actors are going, we don't want more money for things that are tanking. If people aren't watching it, we, of course, there's no, there's no, but, but for the shows that are doing well, there, there should be a small pool of your profit from that period of time. And it gets divvied out based on which shows are outperforming the others. And, and that's basically the same thing that happens with, you know, or happened with television, which is fate. Network TV is, you know, phasing out that the other scary thing is there won't be network broadcasting as we know it. It's all going to be streaming content. And unless we figure out a way to fairly 
spread the wealth, it's going to run away from the, the labor class. And that, that's the scary part. And that's just the finance. That's not technology yet, which we haven't even touched on. Well, one of the things that I think's come up with this is that, um, you know, why should the average person uh, in Wayne, Westland, Michigan care about this strike? And, you know, look, the Hollywood glamour and, uh, you know, you get recognized places because of the productions that you've been in. And um, in, a, in a better day, we can talk about some of the wonderful stuff you've done recently and, you know, the perception of your average person is that everybody's, you know, living in Bel Air with a swimming pool and a, um, you know, a rolls in the driveway and a, and a small well-groomed dog next to them. I think that's kind of got all the pieces in there. And, right. you know, they're wondering, well, why should I care about what's going on between the haves and the haves in Hollywood? What would you how would right, you because. Because it's not haves and haves. It's the, it's less than 10% of, of the, uh, I can speak from the acting pool, uh, just guesstimates. Um, it's over 80% of the 160,000 actors who are a member of SAG-AFTRA can't make enough money a year to pay their health insurance. They, they can't make their 20-some thousand dollar minimum to have health insurance. They don't make enough money in a year. That's the majority of the membership. Uh, that's who we all, I mean, I, 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 gratefully, I'm 62. I paid my dues on Broadway. Uh, another interesting example that I thought of was even in a Broadway show, my last two Broadway shows, you don't make any money for the first six months of your commitment. You agree to sign on at a really low rate so that the show's affordable and they can get it on its feet. And then it's not till if you stick around for a year that your salary starts to increase incrementally that, that I, and I'm, I'm saying this very simply, I didn't save any money the first six months. I only was able to pay for my costs, expenses at, with a at, with a family with two children, uh, uh, and p- still paying for my house in Los Angeles while I was living in New York doing the show. It it was six months in before I actually was putting money in savings, and and if the show had closed, I would have invested that time creatively on that show. And it would have only covered, I, I wouldn't have had anything to show for it. I, I'd start back at ground zero. So that's even a, a part of the, the system, even in theater. Uh, and that was the show that ultimately, gratefully, I won the Tony Award for. This is Billy Elliot and Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, the last two shows. It, it, it's a, you as an artist, you go, all right, I'll, I'll take a risk with you because it is a risk. Um, but when, when things start paying off, Everybody deserves their fair share. That it's just understood. It's how things have been done. It's it's the right thing to do. And there there were there there were. Did you look up there? Um, who Steve Steve? Weber I looked at some was, of the things you sent me about where things stand <laughs> in the negotiation um, and the incredible amount of detail from hairdressers to someone that comes on site uh, on location. I think if I'm using the right term, and they're both a um, a stand-in and a double um, that that and whether they whether a dancer syncs uh, lip syncs songs or not um, how they should be paid and the the I, I frankly was astonished with on the studio side of it or the producer side of it just things that just seemed eminently reasonable and the answer was rejected 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 yeah um, and and I'm wondering is this a lot different than like the strike in 07? Now you were just getting going back in 07 or you were, you were well into career by that time. Uh, in 07, I was gratefully doing a Broadway show. Mm -hmm. So, or, or finishing up actually. No, no, actually I was between shows and I was here in LA, but yeah, but, but literally no income. And, and with two children to feed and a, and a mortgage and, a you know, a, a car to make payments on. And, and there was no work in Los Angeles. And I literally had to go after 
gratefully enjoying the year and a half I did Dirty Rotten Scoundrels in New York. But saying my wife and I lying awake at night, couldn't sleep because we're worrying about finance. And I'm going, I, I may have to put my hat in the ring for a for another Broadway show because theater is under a different union so I can work as a stage actor just just to make, you know, ends meet. And uh, so it did. It did have an effect. But um, what, I, I can remember that I was grateful that I was... But I, when exactly... You know, I'm not remember. I'm not personally hanging on to... A, a hardship other than I forgot that there was a strike going on in 2007 that really made it unbearable in Los Angeles. Well, you know, look, when I observe this strike and look, being a Detroit guy, we've seen strikes, right? They yeah. come and go and we generally know where the battle lines are being drawn. And so using the car industry as a, a, a great example, of course, you know, I'm sitting here in the cradle of organized labor, um, and the, the car companies needed the labor because they couldn't put out a product, no product, no revenue, no revenue, no profit, no profit, no shareholder growth and so forth. Right. And I'm wondering in the situation that exists today in uh, Los Angeles and Hollywood is part of the reluctance of, on the part of the studios to settle uh, or to negotiate better just because there's so much content out there that, you know, there's lots of uh, data that says there's just too much being produced, that there's not enough people to watch all the stuff that's coming out. And are they kind of saying, yeah, we're sitting on enough content, we're going to choke the union? Well, that, oh, that's definitely uh, one of their considerations. And, and the, the reality is, you know, the streaming, they threw, they also threw so much money, like bidding wars on content. Everybody just wanted to, they all wanted everything so they could have stuff for their, their subscribers. Um, and, and actually a lot of stuff, just, you know, a lot of money got wasted in, in that process, but yeah, right now they're sitting, <laughs> Horrible as it is, in addition to uh, uh, the one film that's just doing very well, I worked on two other independent features last summer, and I'm thinking, and I've, I've been having dialogue with the producers, I've been, this is your time. This is, actually, this is like ideal, and it is. They've One of the films has already been snatched up for distribution because, you know, the streamers are looking for because no one else is producing stuff. It was like, you know, I may end up not, you know, my, my TV gig may be done when, if, if the strike goes long enough and I'll be, I'll, I'll be unemployed. But at least that, that movie that I made in, you know, last summer will have, will have a life because yeah, right we, now we, there's a need for at, that content. Yeah. Because of the strike, we're not at Liberty um, to say the uh, anything about the show. Right. Um, the, the movie that's out there, but you've got a box office hit out there um, that is going to be a, I think, going to be looked at as a pivotal work of the era. Um, and I'm under a non-strike situation. The producers would want you on the talk shows and the entertainment shows and being interviewed about the picture and about your role in the picture and about or at least the, the 30 picture. other major stars who are much bigger <laughs> than I am. But yeah, yeah. All, all of that is, uh, it, it, it doesn't exist because, uh, well, the talk shows are done, no writers, no talk shows. And, and they were about to premiere in, in New York. And then the actors had to, they actually pushed, the premiere up an hour so they could at least do their red carpet. And then they were done. And none of us, it's, it's really strange. It, you really feel, cause you know, I'm an actor. I love talking about myself. That's why I was so intimidated to say, Oh my gosh, I have to really think about smart things today. Like I have to really understand this big economic issue. I can't yeah, well, just talk about me. Dig, you got to dig back to that physics background. And I'm thinking, you know, you'd be a good host on Jeopardy, except that that's not being shown anymore because of the strike. And right. <laughs> Maya Bialik, who's a wonderful host, I just love it because she's so smart and so nice, um, oh, yeah. you know, a qualified scientist in her own right. Um, she's like, hey, I'm not going until the strike's over. Um, but you'd be a good pair with her. You guys are both smart and, um, you know, well-known actors. Well, well, thank you. I, I play smart well. 
That's you play probably, smart well. I play smart well. You don't, we all try that, Greg. Right? We all try. <laughs> hey, remember, I, I came from the same roots as you did and ended up with a very successful company and making meetings in Wall Street. They never knew that I had never gone to the Ivy League. Okay. Maybe my accent gave me away and stuff, but I, I learned to moderate my speech and all like. Yeah. You're saying you're a good actor yourself. I, well, it's a lot of it's theater. You know, sure a, lot it is. Of it, a lot of it is theater and your, uh, and your storytelling. Um, and sales, right? It, right. Exactly. And backed up with a lot of numbers. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times we'd get, you know, 20 minutes from what's the market, what's the competition, what's your edge, what are your finances? And then you got the hooks and you were done. And that was supposed to sell stock for you, which I think we did a above average job. This, what you don't know, I, I, we didn't discuss. I'm in the closet right now. And this is where, since this is another issue yeah. that wait we're minute, negotiating. Yeah. You're in, actually, yeah, you're I'm in a physical it. closet right now. Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm like, you know, this is this is dry cleaning plastic right here. This is where, this is where actors really do all their work. Because... I will self tape self self tape means either recording for voiceover work, or I put a green screen behind me or this blue screen. And I work in the bedroom when the no one's in the house um, and put myself, I audition myself. Now it's been a product since COVID it existed pre COVID, but with COVID and, and right now also the producers are saving ridiculous. Ridiculous amounts of money by not having to pay for br a brick and mortar location to hold casting sessions because everybody now puts themselves on tape. But this is the, the, the I, all I, I always say a good actor knows how to audition and sell himself and do it in the literally the three minutes that they have the attention span for to decide whether you're the guy. And that's uh, that's really what actors do. I'm not the actor who, you know, gets the phone call and they say, you know, hey, we got a big, you know, studio picture role for you. That 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 picture w that will not be mentioned was a job which was a byproduct of, of, of me putting myself on tape. And oh, I, yeah, which is which. Yeah, so there's like a strata of <laughs> actors that they like. I'm just going to make up a, one name like a Tom Cruise or a George Clooney or someone like that they get a call and say, we want you for this picture. Right. Because they Those guys are, don't have to audition. They anymore. guarantee seats, butts in the seats. They are a moneymaker. That's that's what they do. Oh, and also, you can Google and look. The major, A vast majority of those top percenters are donating millions of dollars to the support fund right now to help cover the costs for all the you know, below the line people who are struggling because of this strike. They've all like dozens of million dollar donors uh, for the cause. So it's, it's not like, you know, they're even just sitting back and going, Oh, this isn't my problem. They're, they're also, cause we all, we, we all, I can remember a year I made, I made $20,000 after making more as a stage actor and doing commercials. And my agent said in New York, I was in New York. He goes, you know, there are families with six people living in a tenement apartment in New York city who get by on $20,000 a year. And I wasn't complaining. I just went, wow, this was a, that's a slow year. Thank goodness for waitering jobs and catering jobs. But it's, that's, that's who the strike is for. In, because... Indeed, and and you know, I know there was a uh, rally um, recently downtown Los Angeles. Teamsters and the hotel workers were supporting the UPS drivers who were on strike, and right. the Writers Guild showed up to support. Yes, and and, any... and Screen Actors Guild too. Oh, did they? Okay, great. And I have my theory about why they wanted to rep wanted to support. What's your cut on this? Why why that level of support? Why would they care? Well, because we all know that the biggest problem is the 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 big companies don't want to give away. They don't want to share any profits they don't have to. So, and it's also right, isn't that what it, it's so you need to, you need solidarity. You need you need all the rest of the community. You're hopefully you can put eyes on it. I got texts today 
from people I know who are fans who are going, Hey, is the strike still on? And I'm thinking, Oh, you know, for, for actors who are, you know, it's like, that's not a good thing. We, you know, the world needs to know that this is still an ongoing issue and it's going to probably continue for six months easily. Well, here's, uh, before we get in talking about how this might get resolved, here's the parallel I see. Um, if you're a UPS driver, the greatest threat to your livelihood is a self-driving truck and it's coming. And if you're in the entertainment industry, the technology that's coming is AI, artificial intelligence. Right. And um, I, I, why is AI such an important factor today in these negotiations? I know that is a real pivotal point. Well, it, it's, it already exists. And, and um, there are, there are, there are still, there are, there were until the strike opportunities for you could um, an agent could submit an actor to be scanned. Like that they said, we're going to hire you. We're going to pay you a thousand bucks. And then and we're going to have you do all these different behaviors. And then you sign off and we get to take that and archive it and use it for creating artificial, you know, characters. And the, 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 the problem is that, you know, that it's a one-time deal. There's no, and they, they, they're going to own you and your likeness and whatever it is you do. And right now, you know, there's, there's nothing stopping. I suppose there's nothing stopping the, the studios from just scanning content of work that they already own. You know what I mean? We're going to go, we're just going to have our computers look at these films. These are great performances. We'd like something like this. And that can't happen because it's, it's a, it's somebody's work that's now being, repurposed, remarketed for uh, this, for something that's going to make that actor obsolete. So just out of survival and well, let's well, think, I, Greg, let's, think about obsolete. Think about this. <clears throat> Why would you need a Meryl Streep, a Marlon Brando when you can just create them at whatever age you need them to be? Okay. You could just make tomorrow's movie stars. Okay. Because look, right. if the artificial intelligence is coming to writing it's coming into set design. It's coming into the, the camera moves. Why not just create the stars? And here's the big thing. Will the audience in that future even care? Will it be normalized? Will it be accepted or maybe even preferred? And there goes one of the most human things we can do is impart stories through acting and, and, that is, am I over, it was weird for me to ask a question of an actor. No. Am I being overly dramatic about what that technology change could mean? No. And what you put so eloquently is it, it's, we, we, we don't yet know whether humanity will go, oh, this is fine. This, this is, I'm being entertained and it works. So this is good enough. Or how do we, how do we campaign to, show how vitally important it is that the living, breathing storyteller is the key to leaning forward in your seat as a, as an audience member, you know, um, it, 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 oh <laughs> yeah, I can say this. So Christopher Nolan doesn't do use digital. He doesn't do any, um, uh, you know, uh, CGI because he believes that when you see digital imaging, you already know that it's not real. Like some part of the viewer knows that it's being, it's digital. It's not yeah. that they haven't figured out how to make it so realistic. And so things are safe and he likes keeping everything. He likes to create things analog on film because he believes it has a more visceral impact on the viewer. I'm wondering, you know, eventually will the technology get so good? And, and that is the fear. And of course it's like, but you know, we go back, you were asking about the, like UAW, um, when, when automation came into play, uh, the, I think the question was, or isn't the question. So as the manufacturer, we actually save money with a robot and does the quality of the product not suffer, right? It, it, are you getting the same quality with automation that you would have 
gotten with a human being? And if, and if that, the answer is yes, then it makes sense to start automating. And it's like, but as a person who depended on that livelihood, they're going, this is what I do. How can you just erase me for profit? And I, that's, that's what we're facing. I mean, that's what we're facing. In, 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 indeed. And, um, you know, I, someone might say, well, we're always going to have the stage, right? But then I, you know, I wonder, will people w- be as entertained going to see a, a live show? All right. Which is, you know, my passion for the Purple Rose Theater is because I think live theater is really important. Okay. That we need to develop writers and artists and uh, actors and people that do set design and learn how to direct and tell stories with real people. Um, but, you know, if, if, if the, you know, Purple Rose Theater ticket is 35 ish dollars which is a bargain, by the way, you don't have to pay to park in Chelsea, quick plug there, um, <laughs> that, uh, uh, and, but you can go to a, a movie theater and watch a, um, you know, full length feature film uh, for $11 and it's all CGI and all artificial intelligence. And as it gets better and better, you're going to be, it'll be hard to tell the difference between a, a real analog shot and that um, artificially created Will people still crave that real experience? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. And but the other thing is, it's also going to stop going to the theater. Everybody's going to be doing it in their own house. You know, no one. People are binging now in their underwear. You know, in their bed. Nobody's. People aren't going to the theater for even for film anymore because they're becoming. COVID taught everyone that they can stay at home. And that's another huge concern. Yeah, I, I um, um, and I think another part of that phenomena, and I, I've only I've been seeing it on the few times that I do go to the theater um, for a movie, um, but also that are people that are sh- like streaming TikTok while in the theater. Like, it seems to be kind of defeating the purpose. Oh yeah, of going to the theater, right? Or or people are, you know, there used to be a time. It's back to how actors protecting their livelihood before cameras were on phones. If if I was in a Broadway show and you saw a little red light in the audience, there were a dozen uh, ushers that 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 sicked on that individual and confiscated that video camera because actors are not being compensated. And there's a whole black market for Broadway shows that are on VHS or beta. And that was back, you know, in the eighties and, you know, when was that seventies, eighties, eighties. And, but now, you know, everybody, anybody can videotape with, you know, can make a movie with their phone and you go to any live event anymore. And everyone's doing this from a sporting event to a a concert to theater. Everyone's got their, I, I had, I had friends sending me stills of me at, in the movie theater this summer. And and I'm like going, what are you taking? What are you taking? You should, what, what's happening? People don't, people are forgetting how to just, that there's value in just owning that experience for yourself. Why? And, and, in, you know, it's like, that's, that's scary to me. My, in, you know, in, in, indeed. And in just like most weddings now, they say, Hey, we've got a photographer and a videographer, put your phone down. Okay. But, and and everybody but one or two people, uh, Aunt Nancy or um, Uncle Billy, just don't do it because they have to have it on their on their phone. Right. Um, but Greg, as far as the strike goes, uh, two questions because it may have the same answer. Mm-hmm. And one is, when do people start really noticing that this strike has gone on, and are the issues resolvable? I think it has to, I think it's a end up, it's going to end up being a PR issue because even our union, our leadership did not say cancel your, uh, streaming subscriptions because one, one of the thoughts is in, you need millions of people to cancel the subscription for it to hit, you know, the companies in the pocketbook, you know, uh, 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 
10,000 people aren't going to make a difference. And several of the companies, interestingly, were, were showing uh, losses this second quarter. Um, but uh, I, I think it's going to, back to, it has to be what's right and what's fair. And unfortunately, what's profitable is leading these, because I, I can even, uh, with my TV job, when Les Moonves was still head of CBS, and all the all of his officers down the road at CBS, they all came from creative places. They all came up through the ranks. They were all artists on some level and found their place in, you know, the higher upper echelons. And they, but they all have a love and a passion for the artist and a, as the source material and what an artist does, because that was their life. And they understand that. And these big corporations now that are running all the entertainment stuff, it's even at CBS, it's bean counters. Now the, the artistic soul is, is dying. And if it's not profitable, it makes no sense to us. And I'm, I'm kind of grateful where I am in my career because, uh, when the TV film thing starts to, if it all does implode, um, I can, I, I can po possibly go back to the stage as something, but I'm also 62 and, um, but I, 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 you know, it's like kindness doesn't play a card anymore. Doing the right thing is gone. Um, what, you know, fairness there, there's a stat that shows, you know, zero, zero point zero, zero, some percent of each individual company's profits is what's being asked for in, in their billions of dollars profit each year. And they're just not willing to start giving that up. And I'm sure for them, another, it's a hard... another parallel with the auto industry. It used to be, there were car guys, car guys populated every executive corner. And then uh, really starting with Chrysler. Um, and I won't name the fellow that was the finance guy. They started uh, looking at everything through a financial lens and the cars became crap. Okay. Nobody got excited about them. It's the same type of slippery slope um, that potentially we could get on here um, in the entertainment industry. Um, and, and it, and it will, it, it will, it's happening. It's just, you know, insidious and slow and, and terrifying. Yeah. And look, a lot of the streaming companies are losing money. And as an investor, you know, I keep an eye on that. And there's some that I've invested in, some that I've, I've gotten in, gotten out of. Um, there will be a shakeout. They're not all going to survive. Um, right. it, it comes down to, um, I'll be my, the financial nerd for a moment, a thing called an addressable market. How big is the addressable market? You know, so how many, how much content can your average household consume? multiplied by how many households there are worldwide, there's your addressable market. And then how much market share can you capture um, for that? And, and the numbers clearly show some are going to make it and some are not going to make it. Right. But that doesn't mean that the individual properties, the, the movies and the television programs uh, and the like, aren't going to be profitable in their own right. In the aggregate, the, a particular producer, even one that's completely vertically vertically integrated, they may they, they, they may not make it as an enterprise, but but some of their products are actually going to be pretty darn good properties. Right. Um, it, it's going to you'll you'll see, you'll see uh, libraries of content being sold uh, more, even more so than we've seen uh, today. Sure. I mean, that, that's, that's on its way. It's happened. To, it happens to every other industry and it'll come down to three or four powerhouses like it does in every other industry. And then it'll be supplanted by some new technology that the existing people will try to stifle and they will enlist the government to try to keep other competitors out. And um, as long as we don't complete our march towards censorship, we'll probably be OK and figure out a way around that. Um, I love your optimism, and and, yeah. and 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 I like I like to believe the same. <laughs> Greg, this has been a great conversation. Um, are there any thoughts that you want to leave with the listeners, the viewers, and the readers of the Common Bridge? 
Yeah. Um, you know, I, I always worry that people just kind of look at headlines and uh, that we're kind of that, that humanity doesn't yet know how to deal with information as quickly as it comes. So I would encourage for anyone who wants to know why they should care about the strikes that, that are going on is to it's real easy because I'm not into big words myself to go ahead and click something and take the two and a half to five minutes to read something to better understand what the issues are, as opposed to just looking at the headlines and going, bah, you know, the have alls are whining again. Cause it's really not about that. It's a, it's, it's, it's a universal uh, issue that we all deal with on some level and n nobody wants to be um, their livelihood, their craft, their, the way they sustain their family. No one wants to be, eliminated and it's about survival and kindness and fairness so so take the time to read the articles uh you'll be grateful that you did because you'll have a better understanding and a bit more empathy i think i i i concur and uh you know film theater television program it's part of our culture it defines who we are it lets us discuss things um and i'm of course a hearty endorser of getting beyond the headlines that's what this program's about and with our guest, star of stage, film and television, Greg Jabara, this is your host, Rich Healthy, signing off on The Common Bridge. Thanks for joining us on The Common Bridge. Subscribe to The Common Bridge on Substack.com or use their Substack app where you can find more interviews, columns, videos, and nonpartisan discussions of the day. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can also find The Common Bridge on Mission Control Radio on your Radio Garden app.